Proverbs chapter number 27. You're going to read the first two verses of the chapter. The Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for the opportunity to come to your house tonight, Lord. Lord, I pray that you'd hide me behind the cross of your son tonight. Lord, I pray that you'd uh, give me an extra dose of the Holy Ghost. Lord, I pray that you'd help your people, not for my sake, Lord, not for my glory, but Lord, for the sake of your church and for the sake of your people. Lord, I pray that you'd be with our pastors. He's about ready to mount the pulpit where he's at. Lord, I pray that you'd use him greatly while he's away. And Lord, we pray that you get all the praise, honor, and glory for everything said and done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> now, these two verses are pretty clear to dealing with pride and humility. He says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow. What's that mean? Well, the word boast is to make all your plans, everything that you've got going on, for, forefront, have everybody's focus on it, for the sole purpose that you want people to be either amazed, awed, or impressed with what you're going to be doing tomorrow. Also, boast not thyself of tomorrow refers to don't talk about what you're going to do tomorrow. Tomorrow's not promised. Amen. I mean, Psalm 138. Today is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We will not rejoice and be glad in tomorrow because God hadn't made tomorrow yet. Today's the day that the Lord made. And He made it for you. Made it for me. So we will rejoice in the fact that He gave us another day, but we will be glad in the day that the Lord made. We won't be glad for yesterday. We won't be glad for tomorrow. We'll be glad with what God has done today and wants to do today. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. I mean, there is any number. I mean, preacher said it this morning. He'd hate the fact that, you know, somebody wouldn't come back tonight, not because they chose not to be here, but because they wasn't on this earth no more. We don't know what the rest of the day has, let alone if tomorrow comes, what it'll have. Right then, verse number two. Let another man praise thee. Again, dealing with pride and boasting. He says, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. In other words, if what you did was really good, somebody else would take note of it. The reason that you do good should not be because of what other people or what you can say about yourself. You do good because it's good. There's good and then there's evil. You should do good because you desire to do good. You should do good to bring glory and honor unto your heavenly Father. In fact, last week in teens class, we taught on, let men see your good deeds and so glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew chapter number 5, Sermon on the Mount. Right? Our good deeds are not a testimony of who we are, but of who He is. Right? Praise not yourself. Right? Don't do good so that it inflates your ego. Don't do good so that others will think you're a great person. Do good because it's the right thing to do. You want a cookie every time you drive the speed limit? Do good because it's the right thing to do. Right. Right? You want a little golden sticker every time that you pay your taxes? Jesus said, render unto Caesar what Caesar's. Amen. It's the right thing to do. Amen. But he says, let not another man praise thee, and not thine own... He says, a stranger. He says, don't even look for praise from those that you know. Those that know you ought to know that you do the right thing. They shouldn't be impressed that you keep doing the right thing. It should be expected. Those that know you, right? Not strangers, but people that are, you know, yoked up with you together in the church, people in your own family, people on the job. It should be known of you that you do the right thing. It should be known of you that you go the extra mile for other people. And even though they may not thank you for a stranger, if they were to come by, they'd say, that's different. He says, let a stranger give you praise. Not even the people you know. Because let's be honest. Those of us that know each other, we may know all the good that somebody does, but the more familiar you get with somebody, you also know about all the things that they do that aren't so good. Just because you did good today doesn't mean that somebody's going to praise you for it. They know you're liable to do bad tomorrow. Right outside the grace of God, don't tell them what any of us do before the end of the day. Amen. Right? We are capable of many things. That's all up to us. 
But I'm not impressed in what you do, not impressed in what I do. Right? He says, let strangers be involved in giving praise and accolades and glory and honor and reverence. I'm interested in what the Father says. Amen. Our sense of approval should not be derived from ourselves or other people. It should be derived from our Heavenly Father who loves us supremely and we should supremely love. Amen. Right? His opinion should be the only one that matters. Some of y'all about to pass out right there. Anyway, I didn't think that was all that rough. But in these verses, we see pride see boasting we see self-praising and as I was reading these verses I was thinking there's three types of humility according to your Bible that everyone that goes to heaven one day they're going to have first there's the humility of the sinner you're never going to admit that you need to be saved until you're humbled and realize that you're wrong Amen. that's what the process of conviction does it convinces you that you needed a savior Conviction shows you that you're not as big as you thought you were. You're not as good as you thought you were. In fact, you find out, well, I haven't done this, that, and the other, but the Holy Ghost starts working on you and the preacher preaches on, if you're guilty of one part of the law, you're guilty of the whole law, then it really sets in perspective that you're guilty of everything. Because you chose to be unholy when God expected holy. Right? That's a humbling experience. Nobody that truly got in came to an altar or wherever it was that they prayed to get saved and they didn't come to God with their chest puffed out most of them came crawling to the altar most of them come feeling you know lower than an anthill thinking Lord I don't deserve to be here and they're right the humility of the sinner is what it takes in order to be saved you can't be saved unless God's humbled you to show you that you're guilty show you that you can't do anything to change your guilty status to show you that regardless of what you think you've done or what hand you think you were dealt under the eyes of God, sin is sin. You have to be humbled in order to look up to Jesus on the cross. Matter of fact, is in John chapter number 3 this morning. They preached about it. That serpent, that Moses, those that looked to the serpent, you had to look up at it. God had to get you low in order to get you to look up to Jesus. Right, but then second, there's the humility of the servant. Right after you get saved, what did God call you to do? To serve. To serve one another and to serve Him. Right, he said that if anyone offer a cup of water in His name, that they'd have a great reward. Right, because it was done for God's glory. Right, a servant must be humble and that they don't get to choose what they do. A servant serves. They're not the organizer. They're not the planner. They're not the one that orchestrated or invited everybody. They don't get to choose who they serve or what they serve them. You must have the humility to say, yes, Lord, regardless of the situation. Those that say, yes, Lord, and humble themselves, guess what? The Lord allows them to serve in more capacity. He may give them more places to serve. He may give them a spot where they're serving a whole lot more. Right? Instead of doing multiple things, they're doing one thing, but they're doing a whole lot more with it. Why are they elevated? Because regardless of where God puts them, God knows that in their eyes, it's all about Him. A servant's job is to bring no fault to the Master. A servant's job is to put the food out and not to be seen because they want to you know the servant wants the person that they're serving to see the food that the master gave them the food that the master put out and the spread that he gave they're not ornately adorned they want to blend into the background they don't even want to be thought about a good server if you go to a restaurant you don't have to ask for a refill they're there with one already when your cup's low why does a good servant do that because they don't even want you to think about them. They want all the attention to be on the master. If you look at an empty glass, then you realize, where's my server? But up until that point, you weren't thinking about the server. They want to blend into the background. They want all the attention to be on the one that 
provided the meal, the one that orchestrated the event, the one who put people in position because he knew that they'd be able to handle what he entrusted them with so that he could deal with the rest of it. Eh, well, don't know why we're on this, but you ever realize? Now, we'll get to that here in a second. The Lord said, hold on. But the third type of humility in the saved person's life is the humility of the saint. One of these days, we're going to get a body like this. Hallelujah, I'm not going to feel any of that fire. Right? Not just in hell, I'm not going to feel a lick of fire either. Hallelujah. Right? I'm not going to be around when this earth is destroyed with a fervent heat. Right? Where am I going to be? Going to be with him. And in order to be with him, I've got to have a body like his. And, you know, if you believe the book of Revelation, John the Revelator saw somebody that was leading him around heaven, and he bowed down to worship him. He knew what Jesus looked like, which means what, you know, that guy told him, hey, I'm just a servant like you. What's that mean? We look like Jesus. We got a body like his. We got a visage like his. We've got a position like his. We're joint heirs with him. What do you say? We are in all ways like Christ, but guess what? We still lay our crowns down at his feet. The humility of the saint is, I may be just like you because of what you did, but I didn't do anything to get here. He is the light of the city. I don't see any of us shining over in the book of Revelation. We do a lot of singing. We do a lot of shouting. But I don't see us doing any shining because there's only one that from the beginning it was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. The humility of the saint in heaven is I'm glad to be here but it's all because of him. Sure. Amen. Uh, well, all that means that Bible very plain don't have to have a doctorate degree or a Bible college degree to understand that God hates pride right it doesn't take too much of a light bulb inside of your head to realize oh God expects us to be humble it's all Old Testament New Testament doesn't matter if you read it upside down brother Phil I'm pretty sure you're still going to find out that God likes humility and he doesn't like pride you can read it front to back or back to front and as I was thinking about pride and humility all throughout the week, the Lord burdened my heart with this message on why your pride will keep revival from coming. Now first we've got to talk about what revival is. There is individual revival. Individual revival, that could be something as, you know, we think it's complex as a prodigal coming home. Right, what is that? They have revived in their soul back to their first love. Right, it could be somebody sits on the pew, they just got a little cold on God. They can get revived where they're back to where they used to be. That's individual revival. Right, certainly, I hope that that breaks out. But guess what? The revival that we want, it is a collective revival. It is a church experience, not an individual one. It is a community experience. It's so big that it gets outside of these walls and impacts other people. The kind of revival that we pray that God would send is something that changes not just communities, but countries. Now, I don't want to put a limit on what God can do. He said with Him, all things are possible. What's that mean? He can do whatever He wants to. Right? But the kind of revival that we're talking about, it is a collective revival. It's more than just one person getting back to where they should be. It's about a whole unified body of believers putting everything else over here on the back burner and saying whatever God wants. That takes humility. Revival that we seek, that we desire, but is more than just us. It is all of us. And according to your Bible, the kind of revival that we want, it involves everybody being plugged in not some right this isn't one of them uh, what is it, surge protectors or extension cords where you put one plug into the wall and a bunch of different people can live off of one person's revival not going to happen everybody got to get plugged in right? it is a personal choice but it affects everybody and you go throughout your bible where God 
offered to send revival, expected his people to become revived, and you know what kills it in every situation? Pride. It may not call it by pride, but by the actions of the people and the way that they lived, when revival didn't come, they had pride. And every time that it was sent, you know what they had? Humility. Pride is the revival killer. Reason that America hadn't seen revival, true revival, almost 120 years now, it's because of pride. The problem with modern Christianity is that modern Christianity has introduced and allows pride. The world functions off of pride. Right? Schools will teach you all about how to become prideful, and it doesn't teach anything about humility. And Mama, right there, kids, they're going to tell you that you have to know now what you're going to do for the rest of your life. Right? Listen, Brother Jordan. If somebody asks you, what are you going to do when you get older? Tell them whatever God wants me to do. Right? Verse number one that we just read, boast not thyself of tomorrow. I don't know what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I'm worried about today. But pray that if God gives you that day, that he give you a passion for what he wants you to do. Right? Because if you're passionate about it, you'll do it with all your heart, and you'll be successful in it. Not just because you're in the will of God, but because if you're passionate about it, you'll give it your all. And according to God, you reap what you sow. If you give your all, you will reap all that you can. Right? Well, don't know where that came from either. That wasn't in the notes. But pride is the revival killer. You say, Brother Jordan, how can pride kill revival? I'm glad you asked. First off, pride kills revival because pride will kill your participation. Pride, when it wells up inside of you, says, I won't. Now the question doesn't matter why. Could be because in the flesh, you're nervous. You're intimidated. That's the scare tactic of the devil. He wants you to be worried about what everybody else is thinking. Verse number two. Don't worry about what other people think. Worry about what God thinks. Pride will kill your participation because you think, well, that's beneath me. Pride says that I'm the best there is. Pride says that there's not a problem with me. We're talking about participation in worship. What about what happens between worship? Pride will kill your participation in anything above and beyond. But what is above and beyond? Well, the Bible says you're either all in or you're all out. You can't go above and beyond all. But some people have decided that as long as they do X, Y, and Z, right, God's going to bless them. Well, show me chapter and verse on that. But two... They think, well, if I do anything above, I'm going to have to give up something else. You know what that is? It's pride. I shouldn't have to give this up in order to be right with God or to do what God wants me to do. Pride says it doesn't matter what the preacher preaches on. I already know I'm not going to change this. It kills your participation in revival. You know what participation in revival entails? Getting as close to God as you can and purposing to stay there. That's what, truly, if you want to participate in revival, you've got to remove all them things that either you put in your life or you have allowed the world to put in your life. And you know what that entails? Admitting that you were wrong. Admitting. But I, Lord, really don't feel like singing that song, but because you put it on my heart, I will sing it. Or Lord, I haven't practiced that song. What's that? That's an excuse. Right. You can... Whatever excuse you want to come up with, you know what's in the middle of that? You know, Brother Greg says, an excuse is just words wrapped around a lie. But our pastor misquotes that. He says it's lies wrapped around words, and that don't make sense. But, right, really what you're saying, all these excuses wrapped around, it's you don't want to sing that song. Why don't you? Because of pride. Truly. Pride not only kills your participation in the service, pride will kill your participation in revival, which is drawn closer to God. As soon as you say no, revival's killed. You say, well, Brother Jordan, if other people draw closer to God, again, that's personal. 
we talking about collective either everybody in or nobody in either all get closer or God doesn't do the miraculous and you know only things that God can do not calling me and I'll show thee great and mighty things well if not everybody's calling and not everybody's praying why would God do it even if everybody's all in it may not happen in our time frame 120 were up in the upper room they were all praying for more than one day more than two right, go and study it out they had to pray until they was all in one accord that's what we talked on in Sunday school this morning they had to get lined up with the spirit of God where God wanted them and then they all had to be unified then Pentecost happened that didn't happen just because they all decided hey well let's go pray wasn't about what they did it was how they did it they literally put everything in their life on hold to seclude themselves away from the world get into a secret place with God and do business with them until God said business had been done you want to know why that doesn't happen anymore because people don't want to participate there are things that they will and then there are things that they won't do you know why people won't do things because of pride you know why I don't like do a lot of stupid things that my younger brother has done because I had enough pride to realize that's dumb right you can ask anybody all the goofy dances he's done at restaurants one time he got free food at Sonic right all the stupid outfits that he wears no I got more pride than that right I'm not going to look like that I'll remind you for one vacation Bible school he walked through them, those doors right there in a the kilt he wore a skirt in the house of God right yeah can't remember if he did the Scottish accent or not I think he tried but he couldn't keep a straight face while doing it what's that point there are certain reasons that I won't do things but those are petty things Right, those things that keep us from participating those are deep rooted things that God needs to pluck out of your heart pride can be removed but you can't remove it you got to ask God to humble you like that song Sydney just sang about you got to ask God to get you back to where you ought to be inwardly so that you can draw closer to him right? pride will kill your participation right? pride will affect your planning I mean, verse number one, boast not thyself of tomorrow. I know we got a revival meeting come up, but today's what we got. You say, well, Brother Jordan, it's coming next week. I understand that, but next week may not come. If next week does come, which I believe that it will, because God laid it on our pastor's heart to have the revival meeting, why would God lay it on somebody's heart if God never intended on having a meeting? But anyway. That's, that's a whole different conversation for a different day Brother Mike I believe that he's going to give us next week but if he don't it'll still be okay because if he doesn't I'll be with him but if next week do come you know what revival has a great reputation of doing messing with your schedule you know what revival has a great Thing of doing, putting things in perspective again and reminding you what's important. It reprioritizes things in your life. But see, pride is what keeps you from chucking that little day planner you've got out the window and just saying, Lord, whatever you will. I'll remind you. New Testament tells us that what we ought to say is, if the Lord will, we'll go into such a city and trade. Right. if it's the Lord's will tomorrow I'm going to do this when was the last time when he was making preparations you thought well unless God says otherwise we'll do this no most of the time it's just well we're going to do this on that day no thought given to what God wants no thought given that well maybe there's something more important that God would have me do no once it's in the book it's set in stone now granted this is coming from me it's either a side effect of my ADD or it's just my personality I do not like change okay don't like changing paint colors on walls 
right? It was fine as it's fine the way that it was, just painted that same color. What's wrong? But why we got to change it? Okay, don't like it where you know all week long I've been thinking, okay, this is what I'm going to be doing on Saturday. Don't like it when people change my Saturday schedule. That's a holy day. Okay, I rest on the Sabbath. Okay. I've learned that lesson from God. Saturdays are holy. Okay? But I don't like it when something comes along and then throws all of my plans off track. Now, granted, I'm not the best at accounting for wiggle room and traffic and all that kind because of, I know how long it should take me to get there, and if it takes longer than that, I'm angry. Right? But there are some people... It's not because they don't like change. They've just purposed that they won't change. And that's why they're, ch they're plainer. They already know what they're doing the Monday after revival. But what if it goes on? Doesn't matter to them. Well, preacher, if we can, we'll be here. You could. You just got something in here that means more to you than being at the house of God. You know, that it, it's pride. Why? Right, because you want to do that more than you want to be around the things of God. What is it? That's boastful. That's the definition of pride. Truly, what is pride? I know best. Pride is, well, I know what's best for me. Some pride even says, I know what's best for you. Right, but that planner to some people it doesn't matter what it is on them pages. They'll find something to put on the pages so that they have an excuse not to go to the house of God. They look for reasons. And truly, the reason they don't want to give it up is because they don't want to admit that all the time that they invested into that previously wasn't worth anything. Right, you want to know why people like Brother Thad over here will never root for anybody other than Louisville because he doesn't want to admit that all the years that he did root for Louisville were worthless. Okay? He's holding out for a better year. Okay? Uh, you want to know why people hate Michigan so much if they're from the state of Ohio? Because they don't know to admit that maybe there's another football team out there that could be better than the Buckeyes one year. Right? It, just, it can't even enter into their mind. Right? Well, what do they call that in the sport world? Right? They call that fanship. Right? That's believing in your team. That's what's... Well, some people believe in what they want so much, they won't let God change their mind on it. If God was happy with the way everybody was living now, we'd already have revival. What's that mean? Problem not with God, problem with us. God may not want you to change anything in your schedule. But if revival comes, you'd be willing to change it. If revival came and you really got hooked in, you'd sit down and before you did anything, you'd say, Lord, I know that I intended on doing this, but is there something else you'd have me do? You'd be more concerned with what God wills rather than trying to fit all of your wants into God's schedule. I mean... Yep. Okay, we're moving on. He said not to hit on that. Okay. But revive, or pride also doesn't just affect your participation. Doesn't just affect your planning. Right? Pride is concerned about platitudes. You say, what platitudes, Brother Jordan? It's a big fancy word for medals or awards or recognition. Pride is all about being recognized. Verse number two. Let another man praise thee, not thine own lips. A stranger, or not thine own mouth. A stranger, not thine own lips. Right? Real reason we shouldn't praise ourselves is because I know how low down, dirty, and awful I can be. I know the things that none of y'all can see that happen inside of my head. The murderous thoughts when somebody cuts me off in traffic. Right? And I'm still hunting for the sucker that backed into the... My, front bumper of my charger with a tow hitch whenever I find that guy his tires are gone <laughs> right? and I'm going to get his insurance information right? I already ruled out everybody in the family it's like well I didn't pull up too far and hit somebody else's 
So either it happened at work, or somebody backed into it, right? What are you saying? I'm going to find them. Okay, but in truth, we know ourselves at our worst. When we start praising ourselves, we start overlooking them things that we need to work on. That's why he said, let another man praise thee. We shouldn't be focused on what we do right. We should be focused on how we can do more right. We should be focused on where we lack so that the Lord can make us into what we ought to be. Because you know what it takes for God to work on you? Humility. You've got to be willing to yield yourself to the potter's will. It's uncomfortable. Not a fun place to be. Really not enjoyable when he puts you into that kiln to turn you into a piece of pottery. Right? But we purpose that it's worth it in the end. Why? To become a vessel of honor for him. Right? It takes humility to say, Lord, I know I'm not perfect and I'm giving all control over to you to make me into what I ought to be, not what I want to be. Right? That's the definition of humility. Relinquishing control to God. Saying, Lord, what you will. That's what revival looks like. Where we just say, Lord, all my, don't care what the plan was. Make me into what you want me to be, what I need to be in order to be pleasing and honorable unto you. Lord, make me useful for your work. Don't make me into what I think I need to be for you. Just make me something that you can use. Amen. See, I don't know where the mentality came that God can only use perfect you know, best. God could use a mug made out of dirt, right? Clay. And He could use it for His honor and His glory. Right? There's a lot of tools that are hanging up on shelves that have never seen use. Guess what? They're shiny. Right? They still got the foil on them that you can peel off. Right? But they're not useful. Why? Because they're hanging on a wall. You know what useful tools look like? They usually got a few nicks in them. Right? Might have a little bit of rust on them. And you'd look at it and say, well, obviously the one hanging on the wall is better than this one. Well, I know that one's been used, and I know that one's been tested. That could be from China and a piece of junk. I don't want that. Give me the thing that I know can hold up to it. Useful in our eyes is different than in God's eyes. Useful is just being willing to be used. God can use you. You just got to yield and let him do it. You don't have to check all these boxes first. He can use whatever he wants to. He used a donkey to preach to somebody. Okay? All I'm saying is, useful is useful. You can either be used of God or not. You know what determines that? Pride. But see, platitudes, some people only do things if somebody else is watching. Some people, if nobody's watching, they'll do it, but then they run to the person in charge and tell them what a good job they did. Right. Some people make up things that they did. Just wanting recognition or acknowledgement. You know what that tells me about that person? One, they're not spiritual. Because in truth, we don't do anything. Right, Especially around the house of God, we don't do anything to bring honor to ourselves. To bring attention to ourselves. I'll remind you that the woman that washed Jesus' feet According to your Bible, she didn't even ask Jesus to move. She crawled up under the bench that he was sitting on because she didn't even want to inconvenience the Lord. She made herself so low that she could fit underneath of that bench because she didn't want anybody to see her. She just wanted to honor and glorify God. She didn't care if anybody else saw it. All she cared about was doing what she felt God wanted her to do. That show me in the Bible somebody that was mightily used of God where they stood up and they said, you know, Peter, day after Pentecost, man, any of y'all ever preach a message where a thousand people got saved? How about 2,000? John, you ever done three? No. You know what they were concerned with? Probably baptizing all them people that just got saved. But some people, doesn't matter if, oh, well, Preacher, I listened to a great message this week. Okay, tell me about it. I can't remember. You wanted the gold star for doing something above and beyond listening to preaching at church. How about you get in here and let God preach to you for a little bit? He's going to do a better job than anybody else on tape. 
But how about you get in here and say, Lord, show me what I need today. And then stay in there until He gives it to you. But some people only sing if certain people are looking at them. You say, that don't happen. I've seen it happen. Some people only preach if somebody comes up and tells them that they did a good job afterwards. Y'all haven't been to camp meetings and stuff with our pastor much as I have. There's some people as soon as they walk in the door, you know this person, you know that person, you know this person, start name dropping. Why? Because they want to be recognized as somebody that knows all these people. I care about how much time you spent with God before you get up and preach because you're either going to flop or you're going to do what God wants you to do. I don't care about who you know. I care about what God wants to do. But some people, they just want the recognition. They want the awards. They want a pew with their name on it. They want a little parking spot out there, best church member of the month. And then there are other people that actually get stuff done around the house of God. You'd never know that they were here. They're here after late shifts, doing work into the night. Is the sun setting while the rest of y'all are sitting there with feet propped up on the couch? Right, they get here early, make sure that everything's going to be okay when nobody else is watching. Right, the true test of character is not what you do when people are watching, it's what you do when people aren't watching. Because you know that there's a God in heaven, omnipresent, and he, he, we're his temple, his tabernacle. Right, he dwells in us. Everywhere we go, he knows. We do because we want to honor Him. Right? We don't care who's watching. We don't care how many there are or how many there aren't. Right? doesn't matter how long we've done it, whether we've been doing it for decades or we just started doing it, we give it everything that we have. Because right? there are some people that when the boss doesn't have his eyes on them, they start slacking on the job. We all know people like that. And until the boss makes his way back around to their section, they're not going to start working again. There are some people that act different ways with, depending on whether the pastor's around or the pastor's not around. You know what that tells me? They're living for approval, but the wrong kind of approval. Those are the kind of people that will go anywhere that somebody shows them attention. You know what the world will give you all of? Attention until you get so far away from God that you don't remember where you came from and then they'll drop you like a hot potato sure. you know what the world will promise you that somebody out there does care for you well I know the one that cares for you he loved you with an everlasting love and he loves you more than what you know what love is Man. then all he desires is what's best for you he said that he came to give you life and life more abundantly not just everlasting life but the best life that you can have you know what that tells me? He cares more about you. So why do we care so little sometimes what he thinks of us? And we care so much about what other people think of us. Just another reason that pride kills revival. Finally, we've talked about participation, planning, platitudes. But pride will kill your patience. You know what pride says? My time is valuable. All time is valuable. Because it's either time where we should be doing something for the Lord, or it's time for somebody that doesn't know the Lord and their time's running out. Do you know how much a second means to God? Everything. Omnipresent means He's everywhere at all times and in all places. That's why He said He's Alpha and Omega, because He's still back in the beginning and He's at the end. Right now, in this second. You know how much God can speak to somebody's heart in a second? They could say a whole lot. How do you know? He's told me a whole bunch in a short amount of time. You know how much God can do in just one moment where he turned the light bulb on for somebody and then it finally clicks for them? And it's like in all the movies where you know you get like to zoom into their head and all these puzzle pieces are clicking, right? Everything starts making sense. But why does that happen? Because they were faithful to study all the other things and they were just reflecting on the things of God and God said, here, let me connect the dots for you. Uh, you know how much somebody can do to their testimony, how much damage they can do in one second? They can ruin it. You know what can kill a church service? One second of not yielding to the Holy Ghost. 
He said, grieve not and quench not the Holy Ghost. Right? You know how long it takes to quench the Holy Ghost where it'll stop moving in the service? An instant. Do you know how long it takes to grieve the Holy Ghost? An instant. Time is very important to God. But see, pride will convince you that your time is more valuable than what God wants you to do with your time. Patience is not just saying, well, Lord, send it when you want to. No, that's flipping. Patience is sitting and waiting for it until it comes. See, we're okay with well, if God sends revival, because we think that we can just go doing things the same way that we used to, and God in the background will be churning up revival and then just dump it out one day. Now, if you really want revival, you'd be sitting expectantly until it comes. If you're going to pick up somebody from the airport, right, you just don't show up whenever you want to. You're expecting them to be there at a certain time. You know what that means? You get there early. You're waiting. Well, what if they land early? I expect that they're coming, and when they get here, I want to be there. Right? What if baggage claim doesn't take four hours? Right? What if they got off at the, the jetway that was closest to the escalators and the elevators and everything else? They get there real quick. I want to be there. Right? And while you're there, you're not counting the minutes saying, oh man, I could have done this instead. No, you're expecting them. All that matters to you is that they're coming. Doesn't matter what else you could be doing. All that matters is, is that you're where you're supposed to be. And you're waiting for them to show up. Well, if we really wanted revival, long before revival ever happened, we'd throw these things out the window. Right? We'd get to where we expect God will pour out the revival and we'd be expecting it there. Not going out and saying, hey, if revival shows up, throw a flare up into the sky and I'll drop whatever I'm doing and be over here. No, we'd be here because we expect it to show up. You know why some people get to church early? Because they expect God's going to do something. They don't want to miss out. You know why some people stay around the house of God? Because they expect that you know, God may just keep doing things. I remember... What I can't remember which camp meeting it was, but I remember one of the camp meetings. Right, everybody's shaking hands, gone home, and I get a phone call a little bit later. Hey, God's doing something out in the parking lot. Brother Greg's young people. I pulled a U-turn on Pleasant Valley. I'm like, hey, we're going back. I won't miss it. But if we were expecting them to do something, all of us would have been out there. Now I get it. God does unexpected things at unexpected times. But the point is, pride says, well, we'll wait this long. Anything more than that, and I've got better things to do. Not, not too long ago, what was it? I think it was a Friday after Valentine's Day, Grandma and Grandpa said, hey, Jordan, Sydney, you want to go to Red Lobster? After an hour of waiting, I said, I don't want Red Lobster no more. My patience ran out. Right? I was hungry. I hadn't eaten all day. Right? I wasn't going to stand around and wait anymore. I went and got food and went home. But he's like, my time was more valuable than just sitting there waiting for something to do. Right? Well, we're the same way around the things of God, if we're honest. We're the same way with the things of God. Well, I'll allow this much time for this. Now, anything more than this, we better be out by this time. Now, why do people even schedule things on Sundays? Right. Talking about church people. Right. Well, we're going to go do this in between church services. Y'all ever hear about, you know, like traffics or car wrecks that back up the interstate and then you can't get back to church? Right, we've got family. You can ask them. It's on their side. The family blame them. But we got fam throw family reunions on Sundays. We stopped getting invites. They knew we weren't going to show up. Right? Some people say, well, I've got this much time for God, and then I've got to go this in between. What if all of our thises just throw out the window? Because right? if revival shows up, they will go out the window. 
But all these conditions on, well, I can be there at this time. That's pride. Not talking about being providentially hindered. That means God put it in your life and kept you from being there. That's what providence means. Right? Some people got to work. Some people are going to be sick. Some people, right, may have to take somebody to an emergency room. Right? That's called providentially hindered. That I'm talking people that try to budget every minute of their life to something. And they've determined that from 6 o'clock until 7.21 and 15 seconds, they'll be at church on Sunday night. Right? They've determined that, well, if there's any more than two songs, God wasn't in it. If the preacher starts preaching on this, it's not worth my time. They stop shouting. You say, it doesn't happen. It gets real quiet when the pre pastor's preaching. And I, every now and then I look around and I'm like, where are all the people that were shouting earlier? Nobody left. They're still here. Is it true or not true? Is God right or is God right? Those are the only two options. Well, you say, it's more than just a schedule. You could be, anybody ever go to a movie and think, okay, this has promise. And then there's a moment in the movie where you're still going to sit there because you paid for it and you're going to eat your popcorn that you paid 18 bucks for, right? But the rest of the movie, you're thinking, this is a waste of time. You know what that is? That's pride. This is beneath me, is what you're saying. How many times have you sat in a church service and thought, but it doesn't matter what happens after that. It's done. It's, it's killed. Well, you may have killed your spirit. doesn't mean that God was done doing something. Right. But what causes it? Pride. Right? I have a level of expectation when I come to church, and if it doesn't meet that, then it was a waste of time. Yeah, I have an expectation too. God, I come to give. I didn't come to get another. It's worship. We bring our best to Him to glorify His name. Now, ideally, big preachers show up every Sunday. Because sure. right? we just came one and see Him do something that we've never seen before, and then He honors it and does it. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? Anything other than what God wants? Wrong expectation. Anything other than how long God says it should take? Wrong expectation. Anything longer than... Well, if this doesn't happen, this doesn't happen, this doesn't happen, God can't be in it. Says who? Right? Humility says, Lord, however you need to orchestrate it, however it needs to come about, doesn't matter who needs to get up and testify, who needs to get up and sing, Lord, you do it your way because I want the end result. The process, that's his business. Right? I'm there to receive to go out and empty myself into the world come back get filled up again rinse and repeat right. Lord I don't care how long it takes to turn the spigot on but Lord when it, get, when it comes on I'm going to be here doesn't matter what else is going on in the world right this is the most important it's never a waste of time to invest in the things of God but what are you saying brother Jordan every revival is killed because of pride comes down to you didn't want it so God didn't send it that's what pride says pride says here's what I want and if it wasn't revival you didn't want it pride says this is what my life will be regardless what anybody or anything says regardless what happens this is what's marked out in my life so I, just going to be honest with you. That's why I've always had a problem with giving money to a retirement fund because I'm convinced that Jesus is going to call me out of here before I retire anyway. Right? I mean, in middle school, I was convinced what's the point in even applying to colleges? Jesus is going to come back before then. Right? You think I'm nuts? I, soon and very soon, he's coming. He said, Brother Jordan, what's your 401k look like? Not good because I'm convinced I won't need it. Right? I'm not leaving the devil any of the antichrist any more money. Right? What's the point we're getting at? Humility says, Lord, whatever you want me to do. Pride says, Lord, I'll do what I want to do my way or for my reasons. 
or I'll do it the way that I think is best. Humility just says, Lord, what would you have me do? Because we already know how God wants it to be done, our best. Pride says, well, I'll give you this much because that's all I can afford to give you. But I'm glad Jesus didn't just afford to give us a partial salvation. But he said, you know what, I'll, I'll pay for this many sins, but anything above that, you're on your own. Right? The lunacy of what some people's mentalities are, all you got to do is say, well, what if Jesus thought that way? And they'd say, well, Jesus would never. Then why would you? We're supposed to be like him. In the garden, Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, Lord, not my will, but thine. They also prayed for the cup to pass from him. What was that cup? That his body was failing right then and there. He was praying, I want to go to the cross. Jesus knew that was the reason. He took on flesh, was to go to the cross. But yet he still prayed. Even He knew what God's will was, but he prayed, if it be your will, he said, I'll drink the cup. God being God in the flesh knew what the will of God was, but yet he even was humble enough to pray, Lord, I pray for your will to be done. He knew what the will of God was. He could have prayed it. Why did he pray that way? For our example. Lord, I'm pretty sure you don't want me to drink this cup. But Lord, if it is your will, I will drink it. Because I'm not above anything. Nothing is beneath me. Your will be done for your honor and your glory. If people lived like that, we'd have revival. You know why people don't live like that? Pride. Ms. Renee, if you would, come and play the piano. Brother Josh is coming. Brother Clint's coming. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you'd take these humble efforts of your servant. Lord, I pray that you'd help your people. Lord, I pray that you'd direct this invitation service, Lord. I pray that people get help. Lord, I pray that nothing be done contrary to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.